five, <laughs> four, three. Yummy like a gummy bear. It's the internet, you're busy. Let's do this for April 15th, 2024. For the next hour or so, let me help you sort through the world of gaming on Game Mess Mornings Live with me, Jeff Grubb. Today, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth sales might look a little disappointing, and everyone is excited about the apocalypse thanks to the Fallout TV show. But first, please join me in welcoming today's co-host of Game Mess Mornings. It's Emma Fife, everybody. Emma, how are you doing? I'm great, but wrestling with the knowledge that uh, if in the event of the apocalypse, I would absolutely not be one of the um, select few who get to go live safely in vaults. <laughs> now, safely in vaults is one way of putting it. Safely my in vaults is right. one way of putting it. Yeah, yes. no, that's true. That's true. That's very true. <laughs> my, my understanding is might not be so safe. I it's don't not know. So, nah, it's, it's really not. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that, yeah, I mean, we'll talk about the Fallout TV series. That's that's on the docket today. So, yes, it is. And I've, I've only watched a little bit, but okay, uh, we've um, only watched the first three episodes. So okay. very cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into all of it, of yeah. course. Uh, but, you yeah, know, how's it been going since last week? How are you hanging out or uh, how was your uh, uh, eclipse and all that? Oh, it was great. It was only a partial eclipse here in Los Angeles. But the thing that was really great is that I live on the top floor of my apartment building and oh, both of the cool. buildings directly across the street from us are one story shorter than our building. So we have oh, a very cool. clear view of the sky um, and we are on the east side of the building. So this, you know, it was around probably our eclipse was mostly happening between like 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. Pacific time. So. I mean, where our balcony is was the perfect place for an absolutely stellar, clear view. Uh, so that was great. And I had eclipse glasses, so I could look directly at the sun. Yes, and I, I did a bunch. Looked directly at that mf -er. Uh And then uh, the total eclipse happened. It was it was amazing. Uh, That's it, sick. It, yeah, it was like, I'm like, yeah, yeah. It was like last week we're getting ready for it. And now, yeah. yeah. It, and it was, uh, it worked out great. The um thing we were worried about, the clouds, there was haze and we could still see the sun very clearly through the clouds and Good. then when totality <laughs> happened it basically all cleared up so we were nighttime. able to look without the glasses yeah. and it was like nighttime yeah it was really cool uh, uh how about games you've been playing anything recently that you're uh, excited about that you've been playing that you're happy like oh man i'm glad i have this game or is it still all like final fantasy 7 well Rebirth? you know man it was such a busy work week last week oh, yeah. uh mostly i feel like i've been uh working on other stuff in the living room sure. while Gabe, my fiance, plays Bellagio. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yes. The perfect life. Yes, exactly. So I've been I've been like playing Bellatro by osmosis. Um yeah, and then just, you know, occasionally getting back to mostly just playing Queen's Blood in uh in uh seven rebirth which is making me go uh, maybe i should just play blood for maybe i should just pick up a game that is a card game and it's not oh, yeah. a, an accessory to a larger thing uh all right you know what we should we should get in here well actually real quick uh, uh you know who walton goggins is right of course i know who walton <laughs> goggins is <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what i figured yeah it became a, it's just a small thing because so mike doesn't like pay attention to this stuff so he would he was people uh, talk about walton goggins he's like that sounds like a made-up name and it's like ah yeah no. i mean but he's like he's america's sweetheart he is uh, he is so. i think he has like his own liquor also they all, like that, I think... that is like a thing they all do like, yeah because um you know the, the 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 guys from Breaking Bad have their yep. tequila. Is it? Um, yeah, a lot of celebrities have. Right, and uh, then I think that's actually how uh, like George Clooney became especially rich. Is he sold his? Uh, I think it was like a vodka brand or something. Yes, he sold that, and that made him way more money than he's ever had before. So uh, yeah. apparently, like that's like the new meta for uh, celebrities is to sell your alcohol brand. Yeah, it wasn't I feel like Crystal Skull vodka though? Because I see a lot of people talking about it in chat. I feel like that was Dan Aykroyd, maybe. That's I don't know. Like, yes, I feel yes, like I is. had a note in my phone for the longest time that just said Crystal Skull vodka, Dan Aykroyd, and I have no idea why. <laughs> we, there was hey, no other context. We all on have this note. that note. We all do. <laughs> it's so like yes. Well, honestly, raise your hand if you have that. I absolutely have that note as well. Oh, God. Dan Eckard, Crystal Skull, Vodka. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I just love thinking about Dan Aykroyd. The best part about him and uh, Ghost, yes, in general, and Ghostbusters is, yeah, he pretty much believes all this stuff, and that makes it that much more fun. Yep, yep. <sighs> all right, now let's explain what we do here. Most weekdays, <laughs> I, Jeff Grubb, will help piece your gaming life back together. That includes breaking news and maybe even some of our own original reporting. Mm -hmm. For all these topics, I'll get the input of a bona fide expert who will make me look smart. If you're watching live on Twitch, Welcome. You can always listen to the show later on podcast feeds by searching for Game Mess Mornings or find the RSS on GiantBomb.com. You can also catch the show later with chapters and timestamps on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. All right, we have a lot to get into, so let's start the morning mess with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth under, is underperforming, says industry analyst. This is from Vicky Blake at Eurogamer. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth has reportedly sold about half the sales of its predecessor a remake, no, re predecessor, you know, capital R remake yes. in the same time <laughs> frame. Uh, that's according to industry analyst Daniel Ahmad, uh, who, who confirmed earlier today that the highly anticipated RPG is underperforming sales-wise. Not to be that guy, but Rebirth is underperforming sales-wise, Ahmad said, uh, who is Director of Research and Insights at Nico Partners. Uh, when asked to justify his statement, Ahmad added, it's selling about half of what Remix sold in the same time frame and looks like it'll have a weaker tail prior to any PS Plus-like release. When then pressed for a source, Ahmad confirmed that the sales data came from Equities Research Reports, who are getting the data from the usual trackers. Um... I am not too surprised by this, Emma. Um, there, there's, you know, a couple of things working against a game like this. One, it's sure. on PlayStation. It's on PlayStation Five exclusively. Five. Yep. And that's, yep. there's fewer PS Fives than PS Fours yep. at, the, at the time that remake came out. Also, it is a sequel and a serialized p work of fiction where it's like, you know, oh, yes. just by the law of numbers, it's like, you know, there's going to be fewer people who played Remake or, you know, you're, you're selling to people who played Remake, right? Yes. They're not all going to come to Rebirth, even though Square, Squaresoft is like, or Square Enix, Jesus, Squaresoft. Square Enix is going to be like, hey, you could play this. You don't need to play the first game. Most no, people that's... fully understand you need to play it. Categorically untrue. Um, so the thing that is interesting about this is that I have had several friends who had not played Remake now playing Remake and texting me yeah. saying, oh my God, I like Final Fantasy now. So that's <laughs> great, but they're not gonna play Rebirth till they finish Remake, you know? Yeah. And on top of that, as you say, there is the PS5 of it all. And I know a bunch of people who would like to play this game, but they don't have a PS5. So you're talking about shelling out the money for a PS5 and then a 60 plus dollar game on top of that. So uh, this is not surprising to me at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's um, the kind of thing where where this game and its predecessor, when you put them together with the third game that will come out eventually, mm -hmm. I think this game will have a chance to uh, like have another uh, a life at that point. Yep. And it, it, like obviously they needed to do really well right mm -hmm. now to justify all the time and money they put in there. But I, yeah. I, don't, I just don't think this is the end of the story for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I think that this is no. going to be the kind of thing where there's, uh, you know, a lot of games in the last five to ten-ish years that have come out and have become evergreen games. And we'll, we'll talk about mm -hmm. some of the Fallout ones here pretty soon. But, like, every, yeah. everything since about, like, 2016, 2017, all, like, the biggest games feel like if you put them out today, for the most part, they could be sold as is and, like, do just fine in the marketplace. Totally. Um, and, and Rebirth is, is one of those games, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and on, on top of that, you know, the first in the remake series, Final Fantasy VII Remake, also came out in 2020. Right. Like literally April 2020. Yep. So I think in some ways, and and it was on a longest, you know, it was at the end of the PS4's life cycle. Uh, Nearest, so yeah. tons of people had it already, the, the, the console that is. And... Yeah, I mean, you were just in a situation wherein people had time to sit down and play video games. And I feel like right now where Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is really thriving is with the hardcore fans, uh, myself included. The people that are like, oh, I've, I've played all of this and uh, I can't wait for the next part of the story. Uh irrespective of the fact that whether they played the original game or not, it's the people who played Remake who are highly anticipating this sequel. But there are, again, a lot of people who haven't even played Remake yet or people who played Remake to give it a go and they're like, 
oh, that was really fun, don't have a PS5, or decided it wasn't for me. So what I want to talk about now with the, with the story is, is like, let's do two things here. First, let's um, mm -hmm. talk about, okay, then was this a good idea to break it into three parts? Should they have lowered the scope and, and put it out as one whole game? Would that have been better for this game overall in the long term? And then... Like, the, then let's play devil's advocate after that. Let's start yeah. with the first part, though. Uh, okay, so I, I think this can work. In the long run, it might be what's best for, like, getting a really interesting project. Uh, I, I think it's pretty cool. I, I, I haven't heard complaints from my Final Fantasy friends, for the most no. part, on, on, <laughs> on this. They all seem pretty happy. But do you think that this would have been... Do you think it would have been better for Final Fantasy if they could have done a Final Fantasy VII remake with a lower, some smaller scope, put it out as one game, and then had moved on to something else more quickly? So it's an interesting conundrum because right. what they're doing with Remake is something that is very ambitious. I think they could have very easily done a straight remake of the OG game just with, you know, modern graphics, full voiceover, modern game mechanics, all that kind of stuff. Kept it as one game. It would have probably been twice the length of the original Final yeah. Fantasy VII, which I you typically clocked about 50 hours in. So make a 100-hour game. I mean, it Rebirth, easily, easily you can play for over 100 hours. Easily. Uh, so, but the question is, do I think it's going to be better for Final Fantasy overall? No. Um, and, and more of that has to do with the fact that I find it very compelling that they're making this extremely ambitious project, which is for me as a person. For sales, maybe, yes, it would have done better if it was just a straight remake. And even people who never played the original game, I have seen them. I've seen commentary saying, I really just wanted to play the original game, but with like a modern with like modern gaming uh, quality of life improvements, graphics, et cetera. So do I think for the overall sales of the game, it would have been beneficial? Yes. For Final Fantasy, though, what's been interesting about the remake series is that they've kept the dev team together, which is right. a really good thing. And they're being given the opportunity to try things and to expand I, yeah i it, it's a it's a complex kind of question right and hi hindsight is kind of not even 2020 here we don't yeah. really know what would have been better than this i mean i i appreciate the complexity of just the game itself and how trying to make something that would be worthy of their time but also small enough to make as one game how impossible that task would have been so we're mm -hmm. clearly talking very hypothetical here but um Part, part of me wonders, it's like, should they be pushing more, like more quickly with uh, uh, trying new things with Final Fantasy um, so that they can fail more quickly? So, I mean, I think Final Fantasy 16 is, it was an interesting uh, attempt. I don't yeah, know if I that's, the, it's not the future of the series, but it's like, no. I'm glad they tried it, but I think right. they would have been in a better situation if they could try it and then quickly follow it up with something else ready to go. But that's just, I, just not where Final Fantasy, it's like the furthest away from where Final Fantasy is. Because Final yeah. Fantasy games, I think it's Square Enix's estimation, have to be the biggest games when yeah. they come out. And I, I it's like, I, I wonder if that needs to change because I mean, we're looking at a world where, and like this, maybe we can get to the devil's advocate part of it, uh, yeah. side of it now. Uh, we're, we're in a world where MiHoYo was just a, a valued at $23 billion, <laughs> worth more than any of these video game publishers that have been around for a very long time. Right. And what they're doing is they're taking waifus and they're putting them into vari variations of RPGs and action yep. RPGs and action games, and they are making fuck tons of money. And yep. it makes a Final Fantasy feel like, oh, that was the before time. That was my time. That's the ancient times. So that's the way games used to be. Uh, and MiHoYo is doing things the way games are gonna be. And yeah. as, as for someone who has a hard time accepting change, I find that you know frightening and frustrating in a lot of ways. But also, I can clearly see where mm -hmm. the money's being spent. And so, I, 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 I mean, I Final Fantasy does not stack up to what Genshin Impact is doing. And when I look at it on paper no. right now, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I I can see that very clearly because you know one of the things, one of the benefits that we have. At, at fandom is that we have access to all of the wiki user data. And I'm not talking about like your personal information. I'm talking about like numbers. Um, 
that Genshin Impact wiki is, and, and Honkai Star Rail is in the exact same boat. They are so well organized. They are so, it is such an engaged community. I mean, I can't divulge actual numbers, but we're we're in the multiple hundreds of thousands. Let's put it that mm -hmm. way, of people visiting these pages every single day. Um, so it is, it's fascinating because I I'm I love a story game. However, we are in a time wherein the games that are really, really thriving from a community perspective are those ones that are receiving constant updates. And I, I feel like we've had this conversation before, maybe about oh, yeah. the unknown of the gotcha game. And like you are absolutely getting your your tether hooks in with the particular crowd, which is on the younger side, children to teens and even adults, they just love the unknown, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, I mean, that's a, just a human quality, right? That's yeah. just something you can't uh, uh, fight against. Um, and that, I mean, obviously Square Enix has and can make Final Fantasy versions of Gotcha and, and, and these of mobile course games. Of they and could. Stuff. Um, and I, I, I like, I don't think the answer is clearly not, well, don't make Final Fantasy VII Rebirth or an equivalently oh God, no. high quality game. It's just, um, I, I, I think what we're saying here is the reality is, yeah, two and a half million copies in a couple of, a couple of weeks. That's about what these games are going to do. Yeah. And, and if that's not enough going forward, well, uh, okay, well, there is no answer there other than, uh, I mean, I, I suppose you do try to make it appeal to younger audiences, but what does that even look like? It, would, it probably means you're not strictly a console game going forward. Is there a way to make a big, massive Final Fantasy game feel important and also it's playable on phones and, and it's free to play? I don't know. I, I don't, and I'm, yeah. I'm not, frankly, I'm not that interested to find out the answer to that personally because it's just, there's no appeal uh, for me there. But totally. I wonder if that's more and more where Square is going to have to start looking. Well, and, and go ahead. I mean, they do have the mobile FF7 Ever Crisis, um, which right. has gotcha mechanics. Um, yes. And they, I, they've done a bunch of these. And as Sean points th out, yes. usually unsuccessfully. That's right. They're, they're yes, not exactly. very good at this either. Yeah. It's like, I don't. Oh, I, I'm trying to figure out like what the secret sauce is of the the Hoyoverse stuff. I mean, it's it's very. I mean, it's it's what Mike calls moisturizer games. It's having very appealing, yeah. simple waifu designs. Moisturizer. Yeah, I mean, right where it's just like these characters look so so clean and slick, and uh, they have an instant like you look at it like okay, I get this character's whole shtick very quickly. Um, I don't know. It, it feels harmless in a lot of ways very soft rounded edges uh that yeah. sort of thing i think is kind of what yeah. they're and I, you know and i think for for its part square enix wants to try to say something with these games or they sure. have it in their mind and that's what they're trying to do and i think that forces them into a corner sometime i i yeah you know and isn't can, that interesting that that it does in even though yes these games are wildly successful they're also as you say there's they're moisturizer games they're safe yeah yes they are yeah they they are not challenging is and not i don't mean that like they don't have a difficulty i mean they're yeah. not like challenging the player in any way and that's and people want their entertainment i'm that that's not really me uh making a qualitative statement one way or the other I, I probably do have qualitative feelings about it but that's not what i'm trying to say there um and I, as I always can't talk about final fantasy sales without bringing up uh luigi's mansion 3 I, we can we can point out like hey there are fewer ps5s than ps4s mm -hmm. and that this is a sequel and, and all, all this stuff it's like and it's a, a, a exclusive to one platform that does only have that number of, of of consoles sold but you know this is further into the ps5's life cycle than than the switch was when luigi's mansion 3 came out and, yeah. and that game has sold 15, it's approaching like 15 million copies sold. And they never really, they reduced the price like once a year to like $40. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's $60. So, I mean, uh, Apple's to oranges in a lot of ways, a uh, family game is going to just yes. be able to like capture that audience. But I think that's, mm -hmm. that's besides the point, all the money, the money's all green at the end and they're spending a lot of money to make these giant projects. They got to right. be looking around being like, there's... I think what I'm trying to say at the end here is I think Square Enix is going to come out of Final Fantasy 16 and Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth and they're going to be looking around like okay we got to keep changing things up no and and like that's frustrating to me because I feel and, and and I know why they have to do that 
But I feel like in terms of storytelling and trying new stuff, did I like everything that they tried? No. Do I think it was all successful? No. Can I possibly stand to play another second of mini games that are not Queen's Blood or Chocobo Racing <laughs> in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth? Absolutely not. Um, but I appreciate that they were taking chances. Yeah. Um, and so it is a bummer that the money is saying chances is implying chances bad when in actuality, I don't think that that's no, what it is. No way. Yeah. You know, <sighs> I mean, yeah. I think we, I think we look around at enough games that have come from similar genres or different genres. Taking chances usually can work out. Yes. It just, it, it feels like with final fantasy, the, um, they are taking chances while also not having f um, full confidence in what they've done before. They wanted to try new things. And I, yeah. I, I think they tried new things here. And you're right. I think that's the thing that they're going to be like pointing at. Like, okay, we tried new things and here's what happened. When I, That's clearly, that is clearly not the story of what has happened with Final Fantasy yeah. VII Rebirth. Um, I think that that weak tale probably will be true for a little bit. I bet it's going to um, pick back up and be kind of similar to similar to Miles, Miles Morales, because Miles Morales on the PS5 at launch had a bit of a weak start. And yeah. then as people came in, to, kept coming into, this, uh, into the system, they just kept buying that game. And now Spider-Man is mm -hmm. different. It is the biggest of, of these things. But I think yeah. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth's word of mouth has been so strong that yeah. I think it's going to have a stronger tale than expected at this moment when just looking at the numbers initially. But that's just me guessing. Totally. Maybe a little yeah. bit hope, hopeful for my Final Fantasy friends out there. Uh, all right, moving along. Amazon Prime's Fallout the show has everyone playing the games. This is from John Walker at Kotaku. Since Amazon Prime's Fallout TV series premiered, the numbers of people playing various Fallout games has shot up all over the place because you're all a bunch of sheep doing whatever the media tells you to. <laughs> I definitely am like feeling that also when I'm like, I wanna play Fallout. Like for, no, instance, how, like for instance, how I installed Fallout 76 on my Xbox last night. It's perhaps <laughs> to be expected that the surprise not shitness of the Fallout TV show has reignited everyone's interest in the game series on which it's based. But the scale of, of this interest remains impressive. Across the franchise, player numbers are near vertical spikes. This is most easily seen via the internet magics of Steam DB, where players no, player numbers can be conveniently graphed by game over different periods of time. So take the most recent mainline entry in the franchise, 2015's Fallout 4, and look at numbers for the last month, and you can see that from April 10th air date, the air date, the series of, of the of the series streaming on Amazon, those numbers of people playing at one time leapt from peaking at 24,000 the previous Sunday to 83,491 the following Sunday. Um, and this is, we're seeing this across a lot of these games. Uh, Fallout 76 is is having a similar uh, resurgence. Um, and it's, I, I guess, yeah, I think it's, this yeah. is the story uh, that we're seeing over and over again with this sort of thing. I yep. bet, I bet Bethesda like was kind of predicting this recently, which mm -hmm. is why they're like, man, we should finish that update, that next gen update for Fallout 4 that we said we were gonna make. And we should yeah. try to get that out around the time of this TV show. And it's like, they couldn't yes. even really get that done. It's still coming in a matter of weeks, I think. Um, but I bet I bet they wish they had a Fallout 5 right now, right? I bet they do. But <laughs> yeah. that being said, to me, the Fallout television series makes me extremely excited about yeah. the future of Fallout because Fallout has always had this fun, interesting world to play in. Uh, it's got some good writing in it, um, but it's got the Bethesda dead eyes, you know, the 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 emoting of what's going on within the Fallout games leaves something to be desired. Oh, yes, yeah. That is not in the TV show. Uh, and I think that, I mean, how many episodes have you watched? Uh, I've just watched uh, like most of the first episode. I think I watched the oh, entire okay, first episode. okay, okay. Well, in episode three even, there's a thing where you're like, oh, dang, that is a that's a big part of this whole universe. Um, yep. So I think that the series is going to have an incredible bearing on the future of the games story wise and hopefully storytelling wise. Um, it's it's just yeah, uh, I'm really impressed uh, with the Fallout series. Um, it is so refreshing to look at something that is color graded with such an incredibly high contrast. Like 
black is black in the fallout show and that is becoming less and less common in television watch the marvel cinematic universe the whole thing is color graded very gray the color black doesn't oh, exist yeah. not truly uh because they want to give it this like real feel and what's so fun about fallout is that they are embracing the over the top the craziness the violence it's it's so like tonally correct for fallout um and i just yeah i i love it uh the the um and as, as you say like the effect that it's having on people going oh i want to play fallout now um and again it's like 76 is kind of our most recent uh um uh in installment within the fallout franchise so as you say i'm sure they wish they had a fallout 5 right now but hey i mean I i've I've heard that 76 is playable now. Um, oh, yeah. I, I was, People really uh, like it. yeah, uh, but it definitely, you know, playing it or watching the show. I was like, dang, I just want to, I want to boot up some new Vegas. <laughs> yes. I think um, this is like a, a, a indication of like how important it is to just have a game that is an ongoing <laughs> concern uh, because fallout 76 is there and people can go play it. And that is like their current business with fallout. Um, in the same way that like Elder Scrolls Online has always just been there for them for years and years and years and has been growing and has been a huge uh, part of their business. Um, and so it's like, okay, yeah, no, you want Fallout and you want new Fallout. We have that. You can go play that. And we're updating it constantly. And so having one of those games has been proven like hey, uh, beneficial and serendipitous in, the, in this circumstance for sure. Um, at the same time, I think they're like, they're going to look at the, the surge in sales for the single player games mm -hmm. and they're going to be like, man, that would have mm -hmm. been real nice if we had something even just a little bit fresher than four yeah um or, or like you know remasters of new vegas something yes. like i mean th these are and these th these are not like new ideas we look at what yep. other companies have done with their tv shows when they had games sitting on the shelves this is what happened with the last of us they had mm -hmm. a remaster of last of us part two right they put that out um uh so yeah like the, this is the kind of thing where okay we want to make sure that we have our products positioned in the best place possible in the market so that when people turn away from the TV show and they're excited, they have something to spend money on and not like fallouts in any bad position for that. Clearly they're benefiting. And um, I just, I do mostly I'm like, man, I hope we can get a new fallout sometime before I die at this point yes. is what it feels like. So right, for real. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to give you um, a little insight uh, again, not going to divulge uh, actual numbers, but basically the way that uh, wikis are tracked, it's, it's tracked by, trending traffic so basically the games that get the, the or the the wikis that get the biggest boost of here's about what we expected numbers wise right. and here is where we actually ended yeah. up numbers wise so, goals above expected the big goals NHL above thing. expected yes so fallout is already a really healthy wiki community um right. you know they're very engaged very active uh so mind you we're already talking in in the hundreds of thousands right. uh on a regular basis using that fallout wiki this is num this is the number one trending wiki across all of fandom period end of sentence not wow. just not just the games vertical it's increase as of today which would be versus a t or as of yesterday so versus a typical sunday um is the user base has increased by 619% Whoa, okay, holy moly. 619%. Holy moly, okay, right. Yep. And that's that's the kind, <laughs> I think that's the kind of number that uh, they're going to be seen internally as well for yes. some of their stuff with yep. like, with products that they're selling. Like it's, you know, uh, you know some of these <laughs> increases are, you know, 100% increases in, in active players. Games that are already healthy in a lot of ways, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, um, this synergy between uh, television and film and, and games has yep. really come into its own in the last five years. It started with The Witcher on Netflix, um, and this is gonna be something that they return to time and time again. Absolutely. The key, the key has been making a show that is actually good. That, that has been yeah. the real way to yeah. unlock this power <laughs> um, and, and getting people excited <laughs> about it. It's weird how it works out that way. It's weird how it works that way and hopefully continues to be good because yeah. The Witcher. No, no, definitely not. Yeah, I the people I know I never watched The Witcher, but I'm understanding the people. The first got season was it. so good. Everybody needs to stop being babies about the timeline. Um, <laughs> and uh, because once they went like linear and big Destiny bullshit, it got so bad. 
got yeah. so bad. Yeah, I uh, did. Um, the new actor, what's his name? The the other the Thor He's brother. Starting this next season. Okay, yeah, so the that still other hasn't happened. It, felt, it feels like that was announced forever ago. It was um, announced forever ago. Okay, weird. Uh, all right, we're gonna take a quick break. When we get back, we have a lot more headlines to get into. Let's do that right now. All right, we are back, and we are talking about how Ubisoft has started deleting the crew from digital game libraries. This is from Marcus Person at Game Reactor. The race is over for Ubisoft's racing game, The Crew, because according to a report from Game Rant, the company has now started deleting it from people's digital game libraries. The reason is that the game's servers were shut down on the 1st of April, which apparently caused Ubisoft to start scrubbing the game from people's Ubisoft Connect accounts as well, something that upset individuals compared to outright theft, uh, that they compared to outright theft. However, it should be noted that the crew is an online-only experience, so without the servers, there isn't much to do in it either. For those who appreciate the series, there's still the crew too, and the latest edition, the crew Motorfest, to sink your teeth into. Either way, it's all yet another indication of what the digital future actually means and all those online-only titles that have increasingly come to dominate. Um, I wonder personally, Emma, if this is very illegal in Europe. It seems like the kind of thing yes. that would be very illegal in Europe, regardless of what's happening with the servers. Uh, yeah. yeah, you take down the servers, but people bought this, 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 and they like they have it in their library. And sure, it's a license. You can make all those arguments. Europe has a lot of regulations that would be like, well, yeah, but you can't like they should have access to that. Even if it doesn't function, you can't take away their their access that they paid for. Um, yeah, especially because people could like we've seen like fan servers went up for lawbreakers. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit for mm -hmm. friggin' lawbreakers. So it's like the crew people could do the same thing there as well. Um, I, I kind of don't even see the upside here. I, I mean, I suppose, as always, it's like, okay, if that game is in their library and it doesn't work, maybe that causes like a 1% uptick in customer service calls a yeah. year. And you can see how that number in a spreadsheet of like how that costs you money. Beyond that, I kind of can't figure out why this is even something they would be doing, uh, Emma. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know either. I mean, as you say, it's like just, uh, there's not much to do without the servers, but fan made servers exist yep yeah and it's just the the removing of things from people's libraries i i wonder if it's a because you know i remember there was some uh one of the various streaming platforms that some you know you could have bought things through and they lost their license with them so you yeah. basically lose your access it's so like stadia to, maybe yeah, so I don't know if it's if it's a that kind of situation, but yeah, it's um right. I I do, and this is the kind of thing that's going to keep happening uh, in terms of the servers going down, and these games not functioning. Uh, but people are like hopeful that okay, sure, you, this company's going to stop supporting it. Whatever, we've accepted that. That really stinks, uh, and they're not even going to do the work to like make it function mostly offline. There's not like a switch they're going to flip yeah. to, to do that, even though that would be really nice. Maybe there should be regulation about that as well. Um, but if we want to, as a community, do something with this going forward, like we, I think the expectation is we should be able to, allowed and should be able to do that. Um, and so... I. And th that that would be true if this game was a uh, digital, physical, whatever, because it's going to require an online connection to function in a lot of ways. Um, I I think what the, the dangerous thing here is is like they are going to be begging for regulators to come out of the woodwork for this sort of yeah. thing if they keep doing stuff like this. That's yes. why I really don't understand it, Emma, because this is going to draw more attention to what they're doing, and right. I think that's going to be bad for them in the long run. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, and as you say, uh, there is the, this feels like it's very illegal in Europe where they do have a lot of regulations to mitigate this sort of thing. Um, and I mean, yeah, you're you're dealing with number one, there's already places in the world that have these kind of practices in place and you are drawing attention to the fact that you are blatantly going against those things and that is going to introduce more regulation which ultimately is needed because this is the way that we're going with everything everything, everything. is going digital only um and even when people have the option to buy physical media most people just buy digital media i myself am totally guilty of this 
So, but, yeah. Man, the cat just stood up, and I thought a ghost was flying up behind you. Oh, I didn't my know God. The cat there's was there. two. Okay, There's two people. cats roaming around in here. I don't know. They were in their tunnel earlier, and at the the backup Foam Stars duck seems to have made its way to their uh, tunnel. That's not Quackaga. Quackaga is still in the studio. Um, thank, thank God. At, I was worried at fandom, um, but I will bring him um, to our other location for Summer Games Fest this year. Yeah, he's, let's. He's let's part go. of the family. <laughs> I'm I'm very excited. Um, I. I uh, yeah, I mean, this is a, an aside. I had a fun like time like tracking down my like digital only uh, uh, elusive thing this weekend because my kids were like, I want to watch the David S. Pumpkins Halloween special that aired on NBC like several years ago that you could have told us about. And Incredible. Was, it was last year on archive.org. It was available on there and it's disappeared from there. <gasps> and this thing is impossible to find on it. It's like they don't have it on Hulu or it's not on Peacock. Show. It's not on Peacock. It's not hmm. on, it's not on um, YouTube, uh, but I, I, you know, I found a source and I got it. I put it on my yes. Plex server. So now I just have it and they can't do anything. And that's like, that's yeah. what it requires now is like people going the extra effort to yep. back things up themselves, take yep. care of things themselves. Yep. And all right, I, I, and I've yeah. accepted that that's what I need to do in, in these situations because these companies are just not going to yeah. save these things for us. And I, I got a whole some... hard drive of uh, uh, Sailor Moon musicals downloaded from, from right. various sources. <laughs> exactly. It's all Sailor Moon musicals. Uh, all right, Persona 1 and 2 remakes are coming. It is claimed. This is from Jordan Midler at VGC. According to Midori, an ex or Twitter user with a history of publishing information about Atlas titles before the information is in the public domain, the games are planned to receive remakes. Responding to another Twitter user, Midori said, yes, Persona 1 and Persona 2 are going to receive remakes too. Later, Midori clarified saying, to be safe, I will call them update, updated forms for now or for right now. Uh, Persona 3 received a remake earlier this year, Persona 3 Reload. Following years mm -hmm. of PlayStation exclusivity for the series' main titles, Persona 3 Reload was released on all platforms. It's probably going to happen here as well. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they've done a lot to, um, like they've like Persona 4 Gold and Persona or Persona 5 Royal. These games are in pretty good shape. They probably don't feel much of a need to update those immediately. So what makes sense is Persona 1 and 2. Uh, and I, I thought they would probably do this eventually, yeah. uh, but I'm not someone who pays a lot of attention to Persona. So whenever like, I bring up Persona 1 or 2 to, to fans of the series, they're like, eh, it's different. Like, of course we'd want it, but it's different. Um, but I'm not surprised that they're like, hey, we can maybe uh, get more out of those by updating them. I, yeah. I guess, Emma, how familiar are you with these games? And what are your expectations for Persona 1 and 2 updates? Okay, well, I have not played Persona 1 and 2. Right. But I have played Persona, but just to your point, I played Persona 5 and I went, I played Persona 5. There's absolutely no reason why I would ever need to play Persona 5 Royal. And then I sat with that for a little while <laughs> and I went, damn it. I think actually I do need to play Persona 5 Royal. So I literally played both of them. And that was many hundred hours of my yep. life. Uh God, I don't know what it is that Atlas, they got the, they got the sauce, you know, Persona 5, like, skyrocketed that series to a new level of mainstream popularity and awareness, the same way that, say, Fire Emblem Awakening did for the Fire Definitely. Emblem series. Yeah. And, you know... Fire Emblem's done the same thing too. They've reached into their into the past and been like, mm, "We're gonna remake this one." Uh, and yeah, it's just that. Uh, uh, and I think that Atlas is being really smart about this. Their partnership with Microsoft with Game Pass, forget it. Um, yeah, this this is not surprising to me. This makes perfect sense. You have two games that the infrastructure already exists for effectively, and you are in a position wherein you're dealing with a lot of people who have not actually played these titles because they've never had the kind of popularity that they have now in the Western market. So this is, this is a smart move. Yeah. Uh, you know, Atlas very busy. Uh, they got metaphor Refantasio coming out later this year. I'm so excited uh, about that game. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear like persona, but fantasy is like kind of the yeah. pitch there, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And that, that sounds exciting. Um, I, I think, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm not only half paying attention to the series. I think they're doing more stuff with, like, spinoffs Persona 5 mm -hmm. at all times. Obviously, there's the Persona 5 mobile yep. game, which is, like, basically their version of MiHoYo game. Uh, th there's a lot going on over there. So if they have one and two coming, probably a little bit of a ways off. Do you think it happens before or after a Persona 6, though? Mm, I, you know, I I sort of think before. Uh, and that's only because I don't feel like I've heard very much about Persona 6. Yeah, I mean, it's, Persona 6 at this moment in time seems pretty far away still. Yeah. We'll see. And I agree with chat that it would be fun if Persona 6 uh, had college age protagonist. I want, I want all Persona games from now on to just like increasingly go to the next stage of life. Yeah. So it's like <laughs> Persona 6, college students, Persona 7, everybody working their first jobs and then eventually you get to like a persona 12 and it's yeah. just like a bunch of like people in their mid 40s with children and i do yeah. for some reason in my head i'm just like seeing bubba hotep with elvis in the uh <laughs> yeah, in yeah. the retirement home fighting off yeah. monsters yeah uh all right uh ea's black panther game will be open world a job ad suggests this is also from jordan midler at vgc a job listing by new EA studio Cliffhanger Games seeks a principal sandbox designer to work on Marvel's Black Panther. Part of the job description reads that successful applicants, quote, will be instrumental designing and populating encounters, systems, and gameplay within a dynamic and evolving open world. There's more here. They go on to like describe more about the job, but I think when I imagine a Black Panther game from EA and it's AAA and it's a big, you know, it's from, um, uh, people who worked on Shadow of Mordor. Mm -hmm. um, I like, yeah, that game's going to be open world. So again, another story today that's like not too surprising. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I think it's also the right call. I, that's why that's why it's not too sure. surprising. This is this yeah. is the game I'm like, I would want this to be. I want to be able to explore a world as yeah. a Black Panther. That sounds very cool. What do you think? Yep. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it should be sandboxy. You should show up. You got your Black Panther abilities and you explore the world. Um, great. I am very tired of superheroes. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, me too. I just have superhero fatigue. I, I, um, I'm like, I, 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 there's so many, like, I kept up with MCU so much, and then uh, I just exhausted. started missing them, and now I'm like, yep. I, I never even watched Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and I love Guardians of the Galaxy, so yeah. uh, that's, where, that's like where I'm at. Tell you what, though, fucking X-Men 97. Holy <laughs> smokes, is that good? Holy yeah. smokes, is that just the best thing anyone's doing right yep. now? Yep, uh, like far and away. Episode five, um, it is as affecting as everyone said, and that's all. I'm not gonna spoil it, uh, because that you, even if I did, like when you see what happens, it's still gonna be so affecting because they do mm -hmm. such a good job in the execution. It's all mm -hmm. about like setting up all these great themes and yep. giving every single character an overarching like m like meta narrative theme, and then a, a personal reason why all these things are affecting them as well. And that's what always made X Men good. Yes. Uh, yeah. So just gotta love that show quite a lot. Yeah. Um. I have so Panther. many friends that worked on that show. I'm so oh, happy I'm for glad, that. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. That's really awesome. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah uh, Black Black Panther, Iron Man. I think um, Black Panther makes a lot of sense to be open world. Iron yeah. Man, uh, maybe a little bit less so. I, I could see Iron Man having like the open zone stuff. Um, because uh, when you're flying around, when you add that, like, you know, uh, X, Y, Z axis, and you can, like, actually go up on the Y axis way up there, and that can open everything up, yep. um, that could be a little bit more challenging, I think, for designing interesting open worlds. So I'm like, okay, yeah, Black Panther open world, maybe give some open space to Iron Man to do his thing, but maybe confine us a little bit to ensure we're always having a good time there. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good spot for both of these to fall into. And again, the, just the studio's pedigree, this is the direction they were going to head in. Anyhow. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, moving on. Fans have brought back Lawbreakers. This is from Will Nelson at PC Games N. Making a successful multiplayer shooter isn't easy. Not everyone can make an Overwatch, Fortnite, Call of Duty, or Apex Legends, and upcoming hero shooters like Marvel Rivals are entering an incredibly popular market in 2024, and we could easily say the same of the, of the shooter space over the last decade, too. Lawbreakers was one of the unlucky ones as the low gravity hero shooter never got the player base it needed to lift off the ground, but thanks to a fan campaign for new servers, it might just be coming back. 
Lawbreakers launched in 2017 as the debut project from Boss Key Productions, the studio co-founded by Gears of War veteran Cliff Blazinski. The first-person shooter game sadly never took off, with dwindling player numbers contributing to a server shutdown in 2018, with Boss Key itself closing down after Radical Heights, a good game, uh, also underperformed. And that was me editorializing. Shooters <laughs> and multiplayer releases are a tough market to crack, with Lawbreakers and Boss Key Productions by extension, one of the unfortunate losses in the incredibly competitive market. Um, this, I mean, listen, I th uh, there's two things for, for me here, Emma. One... Mm -hmm. I'm glad that anything can come back. This is proof yes. of it. And two, I'm probably never going to play Lawbreakers again. And I don't I don't think this is a sign that like people are clamoring to get Lawbreakers back officially. I think there's like kind of a, a crew of sickos out there that really like the way it played and they are going to play it this way and I'm happy for them. But this is kind of, I think this is also like the right place for something like this to end up. They don't need Lawbreakers taken out of their library just because they can't access the official servers anymore. Right. Because someone could do this and this is great. And now like, there is a way for people to go back and experience Lawbreakers if they yeah. want. Just leave leave the game. Don't remove it from people's libraries. And the people who really want to play it, they'll, they're they going to find a way to make it work. Uh, if you're not supporting the offline capabilities for it as the publisher, fans, they're going to find a way. People are smart. Some people are smart. Um, they got computers. <laughs> uh, and... I don't know. To, to me, though, this also just speaks to there is a community for everything. Yes. And people should be able to support that and enjoy that if that's what they want to do. There's a lot of there's a lot of first person shooters out there. You know, uh, it's a t it's a there tough market. A lot. Yes, a lot. Um, but I'm happy for these people. Yeah, I um. I was like, as part of like this news, kind of the, so like one of the stories had a trailer for the game, a gameplay trailer embedded. And, and my thing with Lawbreakers is, and I'm going to repeat myself for people who listen to me a lot, is um, you look at the game and there's just no faces to latch onto. The characters mm -hmm. are complex and intricate, and there's just no anchor visually to any of them. And so in the chaotic action, you're completely lost. But even look, looking at key art, there's mm -hmm. no, there's nothing even close to approaching a tracer. Like there's just not, it's not yeah. even in the same galaxy as, as that sort of thing. And yeah. I, I, and I think for what, when you're making a hero shooter, people kind of need to want to then go take their hero shooter character and go write some fan fiction or go make some weird videos on the internet. They kind of, they, you kind of need that to like yes. make one of these games work. I think Overwatch is, Overwatch is an example of that, but I think it's yeah. true for, we're looking at every genre right now. We're talking about the MiHoYo games. People feel yeah. that way about these things. And Lawbreakers was just so far away from it that. Was, and I think that's yeah. a big problem. Yeah, I think a, a part of the MiHoYo secret sauce is the is the waifus, you know? Oh, yes. People want to collect them. They're recognizable. We get excited when new ones show up. A lot of the time they do a smart thing and it's a character that already existed. And, oh, cool. Now they're going to be in a banner and you can gotcha them and they're going to be playable. Uh, so you gotta, you, you, you gotta make those characters that, um, people want to head on over to AO3 and, uh, expand, uh, expand upon their storylines. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you gotta be AO3 material is what we're saying <laughs> yeah. here. Uh, all right. Uh, Discord is nuking Nintendo Switch emulator devs and their entire servers. This is from Sean Hollister at The Verge. Uh, I'm going to read a, a shortened version of this, but uh, you can go read Sean Hollister's work over at The Verge. Uh, Discord has shut down the Discord servers for the Nintendo Switch emulators Suyu and Sudachi and disabled the accounts of their lead developers. The company hasn't provided a clear reason for this. The developers claim they weren't sharing infringing content, and the shutdown appears to violate Discord's own policy on DMCA takedown requests. Nintendo has been targeting Switch emulators and related tools with DMC ta ta DMCA takedowns including forks of the SIG patch updater and other software that people kind of use to make all this stuff possible. Mm -hmm. It's possible that people were sharing Nintendo's cryptographic keys or pirated games in the Suyu and Sudachi servers, uh, but this hasn't been confirmed. The shutdown of these servers is a blow to the Switch emulation community, and it remains to be seen if Discord will provide a more detailed explanation for its actions. Um, yeah, I, so I think that if there's any company that can get you to go against your own uh, policy on DMCA takedowns, it's Nintendo. 
Uh, being scared of Nintendo is is something that is common across the entire industry, especially being scared yes. of their lawyers. Um, so that that doesn't shock me. Um, I, I think probably what is happening here is that there are rumors, and I, this is rumors, so like, please don't like you know uh, take this as like, oh, I know what I'm talking about. I don't. Uh, but there's rumors that the uh, Yuzu code might have had something from the Nintendo software development kit in there. And that would be maybe crossing the line of the like the way like in in general the spirit of the law that enables you to make emulators is right. you make it in a clean room by reverse engineering something that is there and yes. all the work is your own in that reverse engineering process. If you were to say have access to the software development kit and be and use that to inform you, you have now crossed the line and you are maybe infringing on copyrighted material or some other protected uh, technology. Um, and so what, what seems like might be happening here is anything that ha might have be, been a fork of Yuzu, anything related to Yuzu is kind of toxic and, and like a third rail and no one wants to touch it, which is, might also explain why uh, Ryu Jinx, I think is the name of the other one of, mm. the, uh, of, of the other emulator continues to kind of go by unscathed. Now that's might not last forever either. Nintendo could right. always be like, and now you're b boned. Um, but at the moment, it seems like, hey, anything tangentially related to Yuzu, everyone just, just like, get this away from me. I don't want to host it on my GitHub. I don't want to host it on my mm -hmm. GitHub clone. I don't want it on Discord. And we yeah. don't care what our policy says. Get this out of here. And it's that's Nintendo, right? But it's, I mean, that is Nintendo. Uh, Nintendo, famously a very proprietary company not only when it comes to their ip but also when it comes to their own to anything that's you know published on their platform uh you know historically the original um you know nintendo entertainment system cartridges they there was basically like a a chip in them uh that so third parties literally couldn't develop games that they like all had to go that's right through nintendo um that's correct and you know there were there were certainly companies um, that figured out ways to bypass that, and they uh, and then you know toys like or places like Toys R Us, our our IP mostly, um, were threatened by Nintendo. Okay, well if you carry these third party titles, then we are not going to give you Mario. Yep. Um. So that's you know people didn't. And that, uh, and all of that what you do is is like the Nintendo of America team. Yeah. doing their main business that that is the main thing that they do yep. is protect nintendo across the board and on every front and that means like you know making sure that the marketing is strong and stuff making sure people think about it but really it's about getting in that ass at the of these other companies and be like you do not f with us we are yep. going to we will make your life hell if if you make it harder for us as nintendo exactly. to be on top here yep. um and that's been true of them from the very beginning from the very beginning yep and it's it's still true now um yep. and so no one no one wants to risk it um no nope. so uh, yeah that that's where we're at i i hope that um we can kind of find some equilibrium here pretty soon because the emulator scene doesn't need this um uh disruption no. people no. that are making these emulators for the vast, like vast majority of them, yes. are doing it as a hobby. Yep. So let's yep. um, create a space for them to do their thing. Exactly. Uh, all right. Let's see here. Finally, Nintendo has confirmed it won't be at Gamescom this year. This is from Ollie Reynolds at Nintendo Life. Gamescom will be kicking off in Cologne, Germany, from the 21st through the 25th of August later this year. But sadly, Nintendo has confirmed that it will not be in attendance, as relayed by German publication Games Wurstkraft. Uh, this is uh, thanks to VGC. A Nintendo spokesperson confirmed the following. Quote, Gamescom is a central event for Nintendo in the event calendar. However, this year, after careful consideration, we have decided against participating in Cologne. Players could try out the games for Nintendo Switch instead as part of other Germany-wide events. Um, okay, so this is like further bringing the summer game mess fo into focus where we are seeing like okay yeah they're gonna be they might have something at um summer game fest we haven't heard one way or the other yet uh but they're definitely not going to be at gamescom uh does that like ma ma say to you emma that they are just kind of going to stand back and let things happen until they're ready or maybe do they have something very quickly after the gamescom timing and they're like kind of saving all their cards for that w which way would you lean on that on those two scenarios look I would say that they're going to sit back and just kind of let 
things play out because what video games are coming out? Like what video games have confirmed release dates dates for this year? <laughs> you know, I feel in general is that there's so much vagueness of, well, this game is maybe going to come out sometime this year. Uh, however, I remember last year that Nintendo suddenly revealed that there was going to be this new side scrolling Mario uh, game, your kind of classic platformer. So do I think it's going to be something absolutely huge? Not necessarily, but I do think that there is a world wherein Nintendo has something after Gamescom, but they just, but they want to again, be able to like really keep that focus on themselves. And by and large, this is something that's happening across the industry, not just in gaming, but also, you know, in, uh, in film and television, you know, with these big companies not participating in things like San Diego Comic-Con, because they're like, well, we want to have our own proprietary event and, and, and really control the news cycle, which I think Nintendo is maybe setting itself up to do here. Yep. Uh, I, I, I think there's, um, really, I have no way of knowing for sure. When I look at it, it's like, uh, they could easily be preparing for something in September to yep. start like talking about things like the first tease for new hardware. Uh, they could uh, have stuff in the summer where like, here is our lineup and none of those games sort of rise to the occasion of like, and we need yeah. to show them off at, um, at Gamescom Absolutely. or something like that. I, it, does this uh, does this make me more or less confident about like a Metroid Prime 4 this year? It makes me a little bit less confident. Mm-hmm. Something that I'm already not that confident at all. I'm kind of like, in the hopeful zone and i have been for quite some time there i'm like not really expecting it to come out this year for the switch anymore uh, yeah. but that's like that's it, this is like okay this is probably another sign that that isn't happening that sounds about right uh but we'll see again there's no way to know for sure um and nintendo you know talk about gamescom i don't think they've said one way or the other about like summer game fest but we are getting close enough to where that's like Eh, they'll probably clear that up one way or the other. And I don't think like that yeah. means that they like have a physical appearance at summer game fest. I don't think they did that last year. No, they, they would have, they had their... there were switch titles that you could play, but it was all third party developers. Right. But they did have a June direct, right? I think they did. So yeah, that, that's I what I mean. Right. Yeah. 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 We'll see. All right. Yep. Uh, I think that's going to do it. There's uh, some reviews coming in for Harold Halibut. We'll talk about that on the uh, on the, uh, the uh, show tomorrow on Bombcast. Uh, but it looks like it's kind of in the high 70s, low 80s right now. All right. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get the poll question set up. While I do that, Emma, why don't you tell people where they can find you on the internet and all that good stuff? Well, uh, you can find me at Emma Fife uh, on most social media. On TikTok, I'm at the Emma Fife. I don't really make TikToks, but I sure do watch them. Um and uh gosh if you if you've finished final fantasy 7 uh rebirth i got a great video up on uh gamespot that's been up there for a while which is um me doing my darndest to explain the ending um and yeah i just you know i'm out i'm i'm out here working people find me at summer games fest in june <laughs> Yes. I'm working I'm working on a lot of stuff for that right now. So. You're working on a lot of stuff for that. You are making yeah. it happen. So yeah. uh yes. The the magic is 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 all flowing. <laughs> it's happening. And, yes. And she's responsible for for the vast majority of it. <laughs> um all right. I do we do we have a poll question from last week? I think I have the EA Play one, but I think that was from Thursday. So let's uh, we'll get to the, the new question here. Um are you planning to play a Fallout game soon? Uh, that is the poll question I have uh for tomorrow. Uh, actually for Wednesday. I'll see if I can get that up on the screen for everybody. Um, and in the meantime, yeah, well, like, how are you feeling? Are you actually going to go check out a Fallout game, Emma? Are you going to like? Um... Oh, I'm so ready to freaking get load up a New Vegas, and I love New Vegas. New Vegas is so weird, um, and, and I just absolutely love it. So I feel like that's that's the direction. That's the direction we're well, going. Let's, uh, let's do a quick and unofficial and non-binding poll in chat right now. Uh, if I were to say, do some more Fallout content on Giant Bomb, would you want us to do a series where we play Fallout 76 together or, and maybe not a series, maybe like one stream, Fallout 76 together, or do you want me to finally, I've never played Fallout New Vegas in any real way. Should me I neither. play through Fallout, Fallout New Vegas? Oh, no, New Vegas I played. Sorry, I haven't played 76 in any real way. Right, yes. Okay, so we'll, I'll make the poll. Uh, what? Would, okay, there we go. Someone's already doing it. 
Uh, yeah. 76 together or New Vegas. Uh, ooh, New Vegas is pulling far, New Vegas, far, far Wait, ahead. but you were saying you haven't played New Vegas. I've it never abs- really played New Vegas. Oh, it is awesome. Yeah, I, it's I, 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 yes. so wild. <laughs> it's like the game I most want to like go back to. So Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Right now, uh, it's about to wrap up here very soon, but as it is, a uh, 77 to 13 in favor of New Vegas. You got to... 78 to 13 there it is that's where it's gonna uh, finalize um i'm a, you know yeah exa- i'm a huge josh sawyer fan just from playing yeah. pentiment uh this i need to go back to new vegas okay maybe we could start that here pretty <laughs> soon that would be fun um I'll, I'll hop in there and i will mod it because i think mods are great um i think new vegas has a multiplayer mod that could be even more that would be really cool yeah um, We'll look into it. No, nope. yeah. Fallout Fridays is a good idea, Jan, too. That's just a good name. All right. We'll get that all figured out. I just, like I said, non binding, but clearly New Vegas is the winner there, uh, which I'm happy to hear. Fallout 76 would have been interesting for like a stream to check sure. in on. And maybe we will still do that. I, I, I think there's st- still some juice there. But if we had to pick, New Vegas is it. Mm hmm. All right, let's see here. I think what we're going to do now is we're going to start wrapping things up. Yeah, anything else? Yeah, what's happening on GiantBomb.com? Uh, we're going to figure that out. Uh, I'm going to a meeting here very soon to figure out exactly that. Uh, but you can expect the regulars. Wednesday, we'll have uh, Super Dan 64. Uh, Blight Club will be back. Uh, Thursday, we'll, voice- we'll have Voicemail Dump Truck, UPF, uh, Bombcast Revengeance. You can expect most of those things to happen. I think there's actually is a new Jeff Jeff this week. I believe that's true. Uh, but we'll let you know all of that and more on the website. And if you check our socials, it'll all be there. Emma, thank you so much for spending today talking with me about video games. I really appreciate it. Thanks for for having me. It's always a great way to start the week. Absolutely. I wouldn't have it any, any other way. Uh, all right. And you're the best audience in gaming. Until next time, have a good one. Take care of yourself and goodbye. Bye.